we have uh, disconnected so we are trying to connect again sorry for this but we will have more time then uh, Martin I have started uh, live again yeah Oh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. that. It uh, yes, just stopped uh, by itself. Yes, yes, yes. Well, we have uh, more time than a bit more than, than before. Yeah. So going back to it. So you were saying that um, I couldn't hear you for maybe for two minutes, uh, the last ones. Oh, yeah. That you, well, ah, that you played the uh, Stravinsky and that nobody was acquainted with the repertoire, but it was your favorite, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I chose to um, graduate from uh, with the concours from the Montreal Conservatory. And those kinds of pieces, the repertoire of Stravinsky and, and uh, the great ballets of um, uh, like Petrushka, and that was Esapeka's core repertoire. So I really, mm -hmm. we really felt a lot of affinity with each other when he I was invited to do those two weeks um, as a guest concert master with him. So we covered two, two um, weeks worth of repertoire. I played a chamber music concert at the very end with members of the orchestra, some Beethoven and some other thing. And um, also um, I played a complete recital uh, for the orchestra members who wanted to attend. So that, that's a process that we still use. And um, it's wonderful. You, you become acquainted with all the facets of a, a person's playing. And um, as a, in typical Martin style, I, <laughs> I remember having really deadlines at home where it, you have to face tough decisions as to what am I going to play for that recital? Um, so I played some standards that, you know, typically you play, you want to put yourself in the best light. Mm -hmm. um, so I played some things that I really know, knew very well from memory that I played in competitions and everything. That I sh Most people would stop there. But me, I had uh, really the chance to play the Shostakovich concerto months later with the uh, Cleveland Orchestra. That was a great chance. I said, why don't I try the most difficult movements <laughs> <laughs> for my audition? I did that. It went okay. But I remember having a little memory memory trouble here and there because the piece was so new but that you know the part of the music making is is risk risk taking mm -hmm. as well but it was a wonderful experience um the um i remember tommy stevens wonderful principal, principal trumpet at the time and working with ron leonard great cellist who had the complete command of his instrument and towering figure a very tall tall distinguished man so he was um yeah, they were great colleagues. And uh, um, Harold Dictoreau was principal second violin. He, is the, uh, he had been there in total later on. Uh, he totaled 51 seasons with the orchestra. And he was the father of Glenn Dictoreau, who was the former concert master in um, New York Film mm -hmm. and a former member also of the, of the LA Philharmonic. So, and now we work together at the university teaching. <laughs> so so it's, it's a lot of great parallels. But there was a, already a great culture of the orchestra. They played co totally different than the Cleveland Orchestra. Um, a lot more extroverted, um, louder, more mm -hmm. decibels, because uh, Cleveland was the opposite of almost any, any energetic American sound. There was, there was, they were more like a chamber orchestra, very delicate playing, well-balanced, and not um, more subtle in their approach you know, to... Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say more subtle necessarily. That's a little too um, too uh, unjust. But uh, they were very um, manicured and beautiful in their chamber music approach to orchestral music. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was a fantastic five years to spend there. Uh, I learned a lot, but uh, I felt more like um, the, the same kind of energy I felt with my first orchestra in Atlanta when I arrived in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, could you describe whether the orchestra's position among American and world orchestras has changed through 25 years of your work. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we can't, of course, build the hierarchy, but I guess each orchestra uh, develops a certain standing. And I wonder whether LA Phil uh, has grown or uh, yes, has grown in its standing through the years. What do you feel, whether it has become more important orchestra than it was? 
Oh, oh absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Much more, much more in people's awareness. The the level of playing has gone up and up and up. Mm -hmm. Every couple of years, you can feel it. Uh, there was there was a tremendous amount of personal change, which is normal after a quarter century, right? Um, so the um, I think having a great nu a nucleus developing, um, such as in the woodwind section with new principles coming in, um, the style gradually changes and the um, you know the uh, ability to execute something with with as much um, as much dimensions, as many dimensions as possible. It's really exciting. Um, for the, in terms of the string section, uh, each new hire has been, you know, on a groundbreaking level. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the competition coming out of conservatories is, is high. And uh, there are many more great schools producing great instrumentalists than before. So it's not just the top three or four conservatories, but you can you can find superb players coming out of 10 or 15 US schools alone, not to mention coming from Europe because all of our auditions are international. Um, so we have, we have quite a bit of interest, people coming from London asking to to audition. And um, we see a lot, of, a lot of good resumes from Germany, England, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And at the moment, you are the one who is also part of the decision making because you are part of the trustees yeah. of the orchestra. Is that correct? Part of, part of when we do auditions for strings, especially for violins, of course, I'm on those panels, audition panels. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work, but a lot of it's a good responsibility as well, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, could you? I know it's not it's not possible to put it into words in ten minutes, but could you describe the specifics of Esapeka Salonen's era? as a music director. Were there also periods within his uh, tenure? And um, could you describe um, maybe the main characteristics of his approach to the dialogue uh, with the orchestra? Mm. Yeah, he's, um, he used to build beautiful program, he still does, where he would um, find a way to juxtapose the, the music of Haydn and Stravinsky, or Bartok and Bach. Um, he, um, he loves, he, he loved certain composers like Beethoven and, um, and Haydn from the classical era and shied away a little bit from, from Mozart. But, uh, <laughs> but later on in life, like he, um, he started programming the, the Mozart Requiem, which I, or the Mass in C, made, the Mass in C was a, I was really, really happy when he um, he started doing more classical music like this because um, and he had um, he had a you know a wonderful approach, very unique approach of linear long lines and and keeping the focus for the longest time in these in these works. And um, he was maybe not as comfortable with programming them before because we we didn't do you know the, the standard popular. Uh, Mozart symphonies as routinely as we did Beethoven five, Beethoven seven, and, and the ninth. Even the ninth we didn't do that often. But he loved uh, he loved that. He loved doing a suddenly a cycle of a, of um, one of the early ones we did was uh, the music of uh, Carl Nielsen. We did all the symphonies, and mm -hmm. because that became sort of core repertoire, this uh, quirky really interesting Scandinavian music became our core repertoire along with early classical. But um, um, so for a while that kept us occupied and it was a great way to, to play tight as an ensemble and to uh, of course play also a very the music of John Adams and part, artistic partners of the orchestra. So we, we excelled at playing some things very uh, rigorously uh, that had to be ensemble tight, very tight. And uh, so the togetherness was greatly emphasized by him. He had a, as said, Pekka has a great ear and, and a fantastic ear and a great sense of, uh, of rhythm, of course. So all uh, those things um, certainly continue to evolve in every, every one of us. And uh, I feel like he's more comfortable now programming just about any, any piece of music and mm -hmm. it's great, yeah.
uh, uh, was he commissioning or inviting modern composers? Because I actually heard that oh, yeah. L.A. Hill uh, modernized uh, uh, during his uh, tenure and uh, modern works appeared uh, uh, more often. Um, no, he was, yeah. he was tremendously uh, uh, at the forefront of, of uh, fostering this whole philosophy, this whole culture here of new music being accepted as part of the mainstream. And initially, a lot of programs were separated into what was called the Green Umbrella Series. Um, mm. A new music group was created, but it was strictly members of the orchestra. Anyway, and occasionally, extras like extra percussionists had to be hired or uh, extra players if some of us were too busy to do it. But uh, there were uh, off-site before Disney Hall was built. It would be done uh, with the, uh, the chamber music would be done in one place, about um, you know an hour drive almost from downtown. And nowadays, it would be an hour. It's maybe 40 minutes at uh, the time on the west side. And uh, the new music group would often play also outside of the uh, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in a smaller hall in Little Tokyo, so not far from downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, those, those series became more and more popular and was a way to attract the different kind of audience, the different generation, usually a younger generation. And because that kind, same kind of music was also appearing in our symphony series, that was a way for us to keep uh, the interest and um, to keep educating our main core audience about the values of great contemporary music and new works. So he brought a lot of his friends that, and that he, or people that became his friends that he uh, had heard of and, uh, a lot from Europe and Scandinavia, of course. Kari mm -hmm. um, Sariaho, Magnus Lindberg. He had the, he was he's close to what a, lots of wonderful artists and, and uh, fellow composers. So we saw a lot of those people that became uh, uh, Steve, like Stephen Stuckey, became uh, regular advisors, even in the case of Stuckey, uh, for the Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's always the, this area that keeps your mechanical brain, your mathematical brain uh, busy. That's good for music. So um, it was a great skill that the orchestra has totally retained. And um, I think the, the way that the orchestra excelled, started to excel in, uh, in the 90s um, uh, and um, when uh, we finally got more international recognition after a tour, uh, mm -hmm. after a residency in Paris with Asipaga, the way the orchestra developed was, uh, it was very clear that it was in, new music was important, contemporary music was super important to uh, to us as a as an artist or as a global art organization, so the change with the change of leadership with um, Gustavo Dudamel, that was not taken away. It was understood that Dudamel came with his expertise, as his mainstream repertoire, extreme um, flair, and uh, and uh, great instinct for classical music, main core rep repertoire, but. He uh, and uh, but he had not done nearly as much as, of course, me, contemporary music as we had. But that that was part of the management strategy. We don't know any of this officially, but we lived it. So in a way, we we know what's happening, and and we kept that tradition alive, which is great for the orchestra because we uh, the LA Philharmonic can learn a, an extremely complicated piece of music very fast. And we have to, of course, prepare ahead of time when we come to work. But you would be surprised how fast things come together for mm -hmm. um, even with a com very complex score. So, and Gustavo is getting sensational with this, like um, like he's his predecessor. He's learning faster and faster, and uh, we all we all uh, are, are on the same boat for that. It's good. How did the sound of an orchestra change when you moved from Dorothy Chandler Pavilion to Walt Disney Concert Hall? Remember, we talked a bit about it and you said that mm -hmm. actually the sound just had to change because of the uh, different acoustics of this hall. Could you describe this process? It seems that it was almost physically felt by you, right? Oh, yeah, it was a, it was a humongous difference of, uh, mm -hmm. of sound. Of, of, sonically between the two the two halls so you had a hall um, with a lot of uh, 
a lot of uh, non-resident surfaces with the uh, opera house, the multi-use hall that we, we used to be at, the Dorothy Chamber mm -hmm. Pavilion. It was a vast place with uh, almost a thousand seats more than Disney. And there was a lot of carpeting around the seats, a lot of, uh, and also it was a rectangular, pretty much elongated form of a uh, theater. So on, in the audience, actually, you, when, we go, when I go back to hear something, the, the amount of sound you get as an audience member is much less than in Disney. Because the, the resonance and echo and uh, reverberation means that the sound is all con constantly filled out more at a higher level of, of higher level decibel wise. Mm -hmm. So that was not present at Dorothy Chandler. So to, in order to really get a really impactful performance, we had to play, we had to use sound production to the extreme. We had to really force the sound out to project what, what's taught in string schools to project your sound. Uh, meaning that you, you play actually quite aggressively pressing the sound to uh, to maximize uh, being heard at a at a far distance with the uh, with the understanding that the extra noise you hear in a string in a string player is not heard uh, beyond a few feet and that's that's at the core of uh, a lot of the U.S. string American teaching that, that was centered in New York. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic. You know, we've had fantastic um, product of the American school, uh, to, mainly through the Juilliard um, way of playing. And uh, that was all, always um, a big focus was tone production, beautiful tone, but also to push things a little bit, like an extra 10% to get her, get her mm -hmm. in the biggest halls, which would, used to be not that great in this country uh, or around the world. There was only a few great ones. Now the many more in Spain and all over Europe and uh, many, many more in the U.S. that uh, are so fantastic in New Hall. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, the, um, so the, the, the sound of the orchestra changed overnight because, we, because it had to. Like we did our mm -hmm. first, first sound check in Disney, played a, played a symphony, and we had to stop after a few, few seconds because we couldn't play together if we played as loud and as, as uh, if we played the same way that we did in the other hall. So um, the the reverberation was long. Everyone had to realize that and say, oh, yeah, we need to play things much shorter. Uh, and then if you, had, if you had something where your line was not as important, it was tremendously crucial that you brought those levels down. And that, uh, that created uh, an, an opportunity. The sound was beautiful, but it was like resonating forever compared to the old hall. So that created an opportunity for the orchestra to um, become much more sensitive individually. Like everyone had a hundred percent responsibility to realize what role they were they were in at every moment. It's like this part's not important. This part's super important. This is where I play less, play more, play shorter than we used to play. We played this passage, you know in a 50 concerts in a Beethoven symphony much longer in here nobody there won't be any definition it has to be shorter in, in Disney mm -hmm. Hall so all this changed the style of the orchestra for the better in a way because we played with started to play with more subtlety um, and uh, more balance mainly more a lot more balance and we could hear how important it was to finish a phrase beautifully and to taper off to exaggerate a diminuendo at the end of a phrase um, or, or um, that's one example. So, so um, that kind of culture, not culture, but style development uh, took place with uh, the continuous um, work with Sepeka. But um, shortly after that, um, Gustavo came. So, and mm -hmm. he was great at stylistic decisions like this. And uh, I told you, I think the last previous private conversation, conversation we had that the first time we had a, um, a concert outside the Disney Hall uh, in, a, in a bad acoustical environment, we could see the, 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 the progress that the orchestra had made because we would uh, usually go to a foreign place and, and, and realize that our sound was not adapted to much else but our home in Dorothy Chandler. So the, uh, again, the, it was the flexibility that we gained lots of flexibility, lots of more listening. Everyone had to listen to each other much more. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a continued effort that we 
uh, that we do every day because uh, it's a large room that we play in, but it's a beautiful sound. So mm -hmm. the tighter we sit together, the better. And, is um, is a uh, Frank uh, uh, Gary um, saying something, um, uh, giving uh, comments on the sound when he is visiting the concerts? Um, He's basically enjoying it at this point. <laughs> uh, he's really enjoying when the, uh, especially when we do something slightly theatrical, um, even if it's not opera or theater, if we have players in different sections of the hall using balconies and the, he loves the uh, the fact that we exploit the possibilities that are in that mm -hmm. house. Yeah, yeah. How uh, do you... It's, it's more, I would say it's mostly the, our acoustician that always has, you know, um, Uh, is always mindful of coming back regularly to talk to us and find out how mm -hmm. we feel. And so um, he's around a lot too, uh, Mr. Toyota. Mm -hmm. yeah. You were going to say? Uh, no, yeah. I have never met him, but I would like to. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, how do you feel? The, um, is the orchestra and its life connected to the city as such? I know that, from Instagram that you have informal Fridays when people can gather and talk. What else mm -hmm. do you do to know your audiences? Can they come and talk to musicians? Are there talkbacks after the shows? Do you feel as one community with your audiences? Um, I think that there's uh, enough opportunities for for that with those series. It's, it's nice. We have, um, we used to call them casual Fridays and mm -hmm. um, And there's, uh, yeah, there are receptions. And basically, if someone wants to meet someone in the orchestra, they know, you know, they know to to come near the uh, the backstage area, at least to ask or if they could see someone. Um, <clears throat> so, and I think that what's happening now with this isolation uh, and the virus is that the, people, the social media aspect is developing quite a bit. We want our audiences to be in touch with us. So that will continue to coexist no matter what. I think the, that, mm -hmm. that closeness and people getting to know us more. Um, I play tons of recitals around town, and but still I can meet someone who will say, oh, it's so good to hear you up close. I've seen you perform for years and it, uh, we've never been so close to you. Um, so there's that, that connection. I'm always surprised because I play so much here in town and uh, So people love to identify with their with their heroes, particularly heroes mm -hmm. in the orchestra. You know the. Um, well, actually, the, maybe uh, uh, when you mentioned that uh, people uh, call you a hero, how do you feel at this particular moment when you appear on stage first? You know, after this small hush when everybody's ready, it's you who who appears mm -hmm. before the orchestra, and I wonder. What are those feelings that you get no. uh, backstage? <laughs> well, uh, to be frank, I could, I could, I could, uh, I could tell you that uh, I have all the confidence in the world and uh, and that uh, not a worry in the world and everything. But all I'm thinking about is playing as good a performance as possible, and uh, and so there's a little bit of healthy nerves going on. Mm -hmm. um, but I do have. Um, uh, a great sense of pride and honor to be uh, at the helm of an orchestra like this, and I have, always have great confidence in in um, in, in the the quality of concerts that we put together. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great joy to play with a you know, with an orchestra like the LA Film. Could you now describe the tenure of Gustavo uh, Dudamel, which is uh, still? One and you mentioned mm -hmm. that he likes to have this, uh, uh, well, you call it uh, mainstream repertoire and has a certain flair. But I, uh, and he also has this um, new project, uh, Yola uh, yeah. Opera. So maybe uh, could you brief? Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. Uh, uh, could you uh, briefly talk about him and? Uh, what are his main uh, characteristics as a person and as a professional? Mm. Um, he's a joyful, joyful, very positive person um, and very energetic, sincere. Uh, he uses humor a lot when we, uh, when we work and imagery. So um, he's, um, yeah, he's just had... Um, 
a good a good way to instinctively find a way to turn a phrase and explain to us what he loves to do in a piece. He um, he will often be uh, listening to the orchestra in a great deal at at the rehearsal. So I would say, compared to other um, leaders, compared to other conductors, he will come with a sense of organization about a piece, but also a sense of openness. He wants to, uh, you know, unless it's a piece you've done so much, like Tchaikovsky 5 and everything, but even then, it feels new every time. You know, you get to a new player to play a clarinet solo or something, some if, um, or, or um, a new, slightly new placement of the orchestra, or, or if you haven't played the piece in three years, uh, things always change. But in general, we, we play a lot of new things or things for the first time. Or, and um, Gustavo sir, has, of course, a, a, a an agenda for the piece, but also there's a kind of a joint discovery going on. Um, so we, uh, of course, we take a tempo and everything, and then we can feel uh, if it's a brand new piece. I said, well, do you think it could be we could do it a little slower, a little faster, or there there's going to be some um, unspoken words about that, or it could be it could happen at the break. Um, and where he will feel that also, if he starts something, he's such a good listener that you'll, you won't even notice that um, in his mind, he probably had the tempo in mind, but he's coming that morning, conducting something, he'll start. And then there's, a, then there's this big machinery starting, right? The whole orchestra. Mm -hmm. So he listens constantly. And, and if, it's, if it sounds okay, and maybe we didn't quite take the tempo that he did, he'll assess things before... Mm -hmm before screaming <laughs> you know so there's a there's a yeah there's a building process that's uh, very unique with it in that sense so it's a, the tempo is just one example you know, but it could be how 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 flippant a character uh, a funny scherzo has and everything or what how short the notes are how um yeah there's just an, an any number of things um so there's a, that's what's nice. There's not, uh, there's the unpredictable is always uh, part of the, part of the uh, building of a, of a, um, a week. So the building, I mean, by that, I mean, just a preparation of a concert. And, and he seems to be, joint uh, venture. Uh, he seems to like to be working with young people. I think there have been more uh, programs uh, aimed at involvement of young people with him than before, is it? Is oh yeah, 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 yeah. The Yola, the Yola project is very important to him. Um, he was raised in uh, in Venezuela, and most of his peers that he grew to grew up with and learned music with, a lot of these kids were from non musical families. They, they were inside a project to keep kids busy and to develop them as human beings as the, as it, with as much beauty and, uh, and exposure to the arts as possible. So they became um, kind of a first generation pioneers in all this, um, kind of, a, uh, you know, creating culture as you go from, from, uh, from scratch, from, from areas where there was no tradition. Um, so that's been tremendously important to him to be able to recreate this in a in a way to create audiences for the future, but also opportunities for for uh, the young, and um, and for us to be educators uh, teaches us something about music making all the time. Yeah. How does the orchestra work with the composers? Maybe Andrew Norman, John Adams, actually, Salon in himself when his works are performed. Uh, do composers have much to say during the rehearsal process? Do they become partners of an orchestra if they, if uh, many of their works are performed? Oh, uh, and uh, like, uh, uh, could you describe maybe uh, briefly the normal uh, mm. uh, working cycle uh, with the new composer and his work? Yeah, um, if they're not familiar with the with the orchestra, if they're first time visitors, sometimes they're they don't they won't say much uh, <laughs> even if it's it's the af the one important time is after the first rehearsal and if it's somebody who's shy then they might just let let things go you know talk only to the conductor 
um, between rehearsals and, and hoping that things will change to if there's some some section that sounded one way in their heads and it totally was different. Um, but others will, will, it's a personality thing, you know, it depends what kind of human being you are. But if you're not too shy, um, they are more than welcome to address the orchestra directly, um, player by player, if they, can, if they can communicate quickly. Because, um, you know, two and a half hour rehearsal when you're rehearsing a 20 minute or, you know, uh, contemporary piece and you, you need to save time for a large symphony and a, mm -hmm. a Beethoven piano concert or whatever else is on the program. Um, there's no set formula for that. Um, uh, sometimes there's a language barrier with the, uh, the composer is hard to understand or doesn't speak much English. It's possible. Then, then it goes through the conductor, kind of behind the scenes. But with with some people like John, John Adams, um, John is so experienced that they'll say, "Oh, I realized, uh, you know, in the E flat clarinet, I wrote you a wrong note, or or that's out of range. Uh, don't forget, forget about that passage. It's doubled and um, is doubled elsewhere." And uh, so he'll make adjustments like they quickly instead of playing the telephone game of telling the conductor, then they have to tell so-and-so. Um, so there's a, there's, there's time built in a rehearsal for such, uh, such mm -hmm. collaborations and for efficient co communication. Um, they're, they're all different, but it's nice to see some, some composers uh, come back again and again. Yeah. As an anthropologist who always tries to attend rehearsals, I, I'm wondering, what do you feel when people are attending rehearsals, when there are open rehearsals for public or maybe some uh, more closed, uh, but for a specific audiences, I don't know, for children, for uh, uh, students, do you feel any different when it's not a concert, but an open rehearsal? Do you feel shy to show the work in progress to, to other people? No, we, after a while we forget. <laughs> we forget mm -hmm. who is there. So. Um, and uh, so, you know, sometimes we, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's easy to not to pay attention that it's, a, you know, that we have an audience there. Um, it's good. I mean, the, some people view these dress rehearsals. I remember in Cleveland, we had them and they were more like a concert. People, you know, really were a public dress rehearsal. Um, a lot of conductors wanted to do their run throughs and not stop very much. Of course, that's what ideally you want to do at a dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have people coming in to, in the middle of the work week, which is a little bit more dicey at times. You could expose, a, you know, some like uh, ugly personality traits of uh, uh, <laughs> to to an to a, an innocent audience, either young kids coming in from a school just for the afternoon. So you have to watch. We have to watch our language or kind of <laughs> what kind of imagery or humor is being used you know, on the podium. <laughs> so it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Uh, do you like to go on tours and whether um, the question about the audience, whether it, it, it would be a, a relevant to ask if the audiences are different? Can you sense difference between American and European and a a a Asian audiences, for example, three types of oh, yeah. people it's in the so world? Di so different, it's so different. Um, People are much more quiet uh, in Europe between movements, and there's mm -hmm. kind of the built-in tradition and respect of an of, uh, of of an artwork that's made up of three, four movements. And the artwork has to be, you know, um, revered and, and respected. In the fact that you observe silence and you let people digest what they just heard, instead of just trying to cough as much as possible between each movement. So you. You know, there's no danger of coughing later. It's such a silly concept, right? I mean, you can, you can. Um, there's a little bit of, 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 of course, of rustle and, and noise, but um, in Europe in general, the, uh, the, yeah, there's more attention span. There's no clapping between movements. That's pretty, pretty scandalous if that happens, but it's just not not unheard of. Um, the funny thing is about the uh, the degree of silence in. Um, in at intermission or the degree of noise at intermission is very different when we go to Asia, to Asia, well, specifically to Japan. Um, I always find it, even as an audience member, I remember going to uh, on an off night with the Cleveland Orchestra going to a Mitsuko Uchida mm -hmm. recital. And 
uh, took, played a couple of Schubert sonatas. Then uh, we were in Santori Hall. I was with my wife. And then we left to, just to go find a drink or a coffee and to come back after intermission. The level of sound was in the hallways, people walking was about as quiet as during a concert. <laughs> and I felt, I felt people are so discreet. They, they only whisper to themselves in the groups of two coming in. I felt like I was in a funeral home. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so intimate and quiet, but that's, that was extraordinary, I thought. And then, but the clapping, then they, you know, they're so effusive and, and generous, you know, requesting encores. And so they're, and um, in Japan also they line up for autographs, which is great. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, you don't, you don't see that here much, right? <laughs> Maybe at the Hollywood Bowl, there's a couple of, a uh, couple of dedicated individuals who are big autograph collectors, but uh, it's not a tradition here that we have other things. Uh, European audiences, as you know, um, when they love something, they'll involve themselves. Um, they'll cheer with rhythm, right? With rhythm clapping, mm. clapping together. That's one thing. Maybe maybe there are fewer musicians in America, but uh, uh, in the United States, people don't know how to rhythm clap to keep it together as a kind of a tremendous like force of uh, recognition to, for the performance they just mm. heard. But they sometimes you feel like a small group is starting is starting that trying to, but it doesn't stay. It's funny, um, mm -hmm. or the or the or accompanied with feet feet stomping, so it's funny. Um, but the um, yeah, I would say it's more the attention level in in the hall mm -hmm. um, that's palpable with different audiences. Um, the um, uh, yeah, Disney is. is is an acoustic chamber uh, that is active in every area. So uh, you could perform a good solo from the middle of the seats of, in the audience and everybody would hear you. So that's how mm -hmm. sensitive you have to be as, as an audience member. So they, people made great, you know, great uh, adjusting uh, coming from our old hall to the new hall because you, you could, if, People drop a program; it could sound like an earthquake uh, if the music, music is very quiet. So they became much more um, uh, careful. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a work in process. Uh, if you have someone who forgets a cell phone, it's too bad that it still happens. But um, it's it's a great place to to feel like when when it does happen, and it happens happens often that everyone's on board and listening and completely immersed in it, and and the place is very quiet and a great performance can do that it will pull you in it will pull people in and and uh, captivate their their attention mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. which is nice that was a good feeling actually you mentioned this status of um, of an idol that you get in japan but i was wondering whether as a musician you feel elevated beyond real life do you have two personalities one is this concert master of L of LA feel who everybody whom everybody knows and maybe has seen on TV or and on concerts and then you stop being this ideal musician and then go to your real life and maybe to teaching or is it not that separate? Uh, it's, it's a really good it's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I could give you an analogy um the, yeah absolutely and say absolutely you feel like a different person in front of when if you like the concert stage if you're comfortable with it and uh, obviously we're all in this profession most of us are comfortable on stage uh, it's normal to be nervous at the beginning of a concert more than at the end um but you feel like the the i feel like if you master your instrument and you are able to communicate all this beauty and and participate in it, but you can also uh, play something solo that will move people, um, it's like putting on a, a, a superhero suit. Almost it, the um, the communication power that it gives you is so much more than um, than speaking on the street corner and trying to convince somebody that 
the earth is flat. <laughs> you know, um, if you have your violin in your hand and you sing a song about the earth being flat, then maybe they'll maybe they'll believe you. <laughs> it's yeah, it's a look. It's a, it's a really bad bad example, but I feel like. Um, you know, just to be able to con convey some sentiments, some moods to somebody, there's nothing like great harmony and, and beautiful sound, beautiful tone, and, and in something, a very sp special piece of music. Uh, same thing with a great painting that you cannot tear yourself away from. What a fantastic feeling to be able to paint that. And for the painter walking on the street to go get a, you know, a French bread and, and some groceries doesn't have that level of power of communication mm -hmm. right so it's a little bit the same thing i know inside that it's there and i know i'm a musician but um it's a very special feeling to be able to give that to people to make the music come alive and, and what i was going to say my analogy is that i heard my one of my absolute musical idols uh, and the, for me the for decades the most intelligent violinist out there Gidon kramer um i saw Gidon once who's um you know, doesn't always comb his hair and everything, and and doesn't look. You know, maybe doesn't doesn't change his suit at every concert. So I saw him, but when he plays the violin, I'm in love. <laughs> <laughs> and when I heard him play once a tango by Piazzolla, he was as sexy as James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> it was unbelievable the power that he has, like like many others, but especially him. I think. He's, you know, he's, he has such uh, musical intelligence and communication and, and flair and just uh, absolute, absolute perfection command of, of the instrument. Um, he's a fantastic violinist and musician. I, I, was, I feel really fortunate to have been in the Cleveland Orchestra and, and to where he would come regularly to hear him in performance. Um, several times so it's several different kinds of music we played even uh, at some point the philip glass concerto in the same program at blossom music center as the sibelius um and i remember a fantastic um, schnitke uh, concerto grossos that he played and um, he came of course to uh came to los angeles as well but he doesn't travel much anymore and um just my only regret is not having the had the the supreme you know, pleasure of you know, reading, reading one minute of a duet with him or something. But uh, uh, so it seems fantastic musician. So it seems that's what people are deprived of now—an opportunity to be sexy <laughs> on stage or to be <laughs> uh, to be different from themselves. You know, to have this ideal self realized in the concert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, also, also. Um, the music we play is so com is so um, multifaceted and complex that uh, most of it, most of the great pieces involve more than one player, right? So this the lack of the lack of technology for true ensemble, spontaneous ensemble, is what's what we're all craving right now. It's very difficult to to play anything live over the internet more than one person at a time. I tried it again yesterday, and I need to talk to more technical people, but it's nothing that's going to be that's that's going to replace live music so we can't wait to be back in the hall yeah in well all of our uh, uh maybe final question uh, when do you think la feel would uh, I'd rather... get back to okay. work okay. no okay Hi. perfect yes i can hear I, you. I can hear you yes uh, 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 uh so maybe we uh, finish now with uh, some uh, one more question when do you feel think are there plans for la field to start working maybe in september we hope it would be nice to be able to finish some of the to to play some of the summer season i hope a good portion of it uh, i'm not um <clears throat> i'm not in you know i hope it's not false hope but um it would be nice to get back to uh playing on the stage maybe in smaller numbers and with with people sitting a little further apart at the Hollywood Bowl, but we would have that possibility. Um, mm -hmm. I know that a lot of Europe is contemplating getting back to normal life, easing into it uh, early in May. So maybe you know, in a month or two, we'll be ready to possibly try that here. Mm -hmm. Well, I again 
uh, I think your a part of the screen has stopped, but I think it's fine. I will finish um, our live now. Oh yes, I can I, I can see you now. Well, I uh, send you again the greetings from St. Petersburg. I think that you like I can't see your video, but it's it's fine. We will finish now and uh, thank you for being part of this live. And uh, maybe we will. Oh yes, I can see you now. <laughs> Uh, uh, maybe we'll meet again in real life after uh, this hard moment for the humanity is over. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I just say goodbye. <laughs>